back in Pisa again. I was here, uh, many of you in the audience, in uh, 2010, I guess it was, for a long period. And it was uh, very memorable and wonderful time. It's great to be back for a shorter period of time. Uh, so before I forget, uh, I'm going to be talking about a part of a joint paper that I've written with Emmanuel Deluki. And uh, it's, it is already written. It's an unusual experience for me that there's paper on it. So if you want more details, uh, So uh, let me just introduce a little bit of notation and I'll tell you what the talk is about. So I'm going to be talking about uh, central uh, arrangement. name of rigidity of hydroplane complements. Um, so I'm going to kind of what it is. It's maybe a little bit of a conceited title, but you know, we need all the help we can get. So what's the rigidity pro uh, problem? Is this? Uh, it's the question. Uh, we have two such things. And, uh, yeah, isomorphic groups. Can you reconstruct the arrangements? Show, that is, can you construct the arrangement back from the group and show the two, group, two arrangements that have isomorphic groups really must be the same arrangement. So, um, what's it say? Um, is that what I wanted to say? So, what do you mean by saying is it same arrangement? Like up to linear choice of coordinates. So, why do I call it the rigidity problem? Well, so this is kind of analogous to Mastow rigidity. If X was a hyperbolic manifold. If I remember my graduate school education correctly, Mastow rigidity says that if two hyperbolic manifolds have isomorphic fundamental groups, then they're isometric. So this is kind of a, an obvious thing, but that's all I'll ever say about Mastow rigidity <laughs> in this talk, or probably ever. Uh, so let's see, I'm going to review what I wrote on page one here. So, uh, yeah, let me uh, specialize a little bit now. Uh, so let's just let me introduce something. So this is essentially the, the intersection lattice, the arrangement, but I understand that there's probably people 
people in the audience who don't know this stuff very well, so I tried to eliminate as much of the jargon as I could and make things more elementary. So what is this? This is the this is the bipartite graph. So the lines, that is, thinking projectively, the lines of the arrangement, and they intersect in points. And so you have a set of vertices corresponding to the lines. So this thing is called <coughs> so A. So uh, what I'm thinking of is is that the vertices, there's two types of vertices. There's the ones corresponding to the lines, which uh, I'm calling V1. And then there's a set of vertices corresponding to the intersection points of the lines. That's what I'm calling V2. The subscripts refer to the rank in the lattice. This is essentially the same thing as the well, this is the proper part of the intersection lattice of the arrangement. Um, and you attach a, you, there's an edge from a line to a point on the point that's on the line. This is kind of the combinatorial structure of A. And, uh, so the first thing um, that you might do is simplify this a little bit. That is this G one is also two. Does that imply that the at least the incident graphs are not nice enough? Okay, so this weak version was much more manageable. Uh, the other. Um, yeah. And you'll see if, you know, I have a lot of old friends in the room who've heard me talk about this before, but they not, may not realize it, or they've read my papers about this, before, but they may not realize it yet. But it'll be clear. So let me just uh, make a remark about this. Uh, so there's a whole result of Zhang and Liao. Little Liao, not big Liao. Uh, from, uh, I'm not sure what the year was. It says if, in this setting, that the complements are actually only in one then so, but I'm asking about something stronger, right? just that the, just that uh, if you like the, the complements are homotopy equivalent, can we conclude that the graphs must be this one? Okay. And uh, before I continue with that discussion, I just want to talk about a slight generalization of this, which is really what the main result of the, of the talk is about. So, um, so that is to talk about pseudo arrangements. So you can uh, relax the condition. Just assume, so remember, A consists of complex hyperplanes in C3. So they're co-dimension two subspaces of C3. So assume, what is this? Assume uh, H and A as the form. 
this h equals it's got a real part <coughs> and its imaginary part has the same defining equations. Actually, I realize this is not quite a relaxation of this, but this is the context of the problem. So, uh, where we go. So just another, you know, if, if this was, uh, I should have said, so what is this generalizing? It's not generalizing the full situation. But if A, if the hyperplanes of A were defined by real equations, then they would have the form H, oh, it's, uh, sorry, H R is the real part. That's a subset of R3. If A consisted of actual hyperplanes with real defining equations, then each of the hyperplanes would have this form, and this HR would be the cone over a great circle on the two sides. Yes? And so I'm saying you replace that great circle on the two sphere with some PL circle on the two sphere and cone over the origin. And then just assume that any two of those great circles intersect as they would if they were, sorry, any, any two of those PL circles intersect as they would if they were great circles and just intersect in two different forms. Yes? I don't understand what well. Can you like draw a picture? Or, uh... Uh, so, in other words, uh, it's kind of like this. If I, if I, There's a pseudo arrangement of lines on the upper hemisphere. They're not linear, but they intersect as they would if they were linear. And that's in the upper hemisphere and the lower hemisphere to see the antipodal picture because they, they should be centrally symmetric. Yeah. And so each of these intersection points has a has a mate on the opposite side of the sphere, the antipodal point. Yeah. So we have this it's hard to draw. Anyway, to draw pretty much this one up like this. I prefer to draw the actual way I draw it. They look like great circles. Thanks. So they can wiggle. Now imagine extending those so that they become centrally symmetric, that is, antipodally symmetric. The crucial point is that they should intersect as if they were. As if they were doing so. Yeah. Like in this picture, I wouldn't want two of these lines, quote, pseudo lines, to intersect in 
two different points. Which is their second point. Anyway, the, the point is that in this setting, so that you still take the same space x. Salvetti defined a complex 30 years ago that has the homotopy type of the complement X in the case where A is given by a linear by real equations. That complex can be defined in a more general setting, the setting of oriented matroids. That's kind of what I'm trying to hint at here. And what uh, Despande did recently has constructed an analog of the complement X in that more general set. So there's a, this, this X is still an open subset of C3 that has the homotopy kind of so, so it makes sense outside of the linear set. Uh, the hypothesis of this theorem is that the, uh, the every uh, Object of the arrangement is of this form HR plus yeah. HR. Okay. Okay. are harder than in the realizable case and it was never clear that you were proving anything more general because as far as I know nobody had shown that the spaces are more general than the spaces you get from actual arrangements. So that's the uh, question. you get from pseudo arrangements of archer than the family you get from actual linear arrangements. And uh, answer. Yes, yes. So if I don't get to the end of my prepared talk, then at least you'll know what the main theorem is. So there's an example of a pseudo arrangement and uh, I'll at least sketch the argument that the fundamental group of this complement X for this particular pseudo arrangement is not isomorphic to the group of any complex arrangement. Okay? And the, the method of proof is, is related to this rigidity question. That is, you want to reconstruct somehow the uh, 
want to reconstruct from, oh, it's up there at the top. Just, just from the group, you want to maybe reconstruct this graph. I should have said something about the connection between the weak rigidity problem and the strong rigidity problem. So if you, if you can establish this first step, then showing that two arrangements with the same graph must be actually linearly isomorphic. First of all, it's famously false in general. That's Rudnikoff's example. Mm -hmm. But it is true for some arrangements and some classes of arrangements. Sometimes, uh, sometimes the, the graph itself has the property that there's only a linear choice of coordinates, a unique arrangement within the graph. So that's, that's break it into two pieces, the first of which may be easy, the second of which um, is kind of too hard for any of us, I think, at the moment. So, but maybe it was true for some family Yeah, graphic arrangements. Yeah, graphic arrangements. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, second, a little digression. I was going to digress at this moment and tell you about the first part of this paper that I wrote with Emanuela, where we construct a different model uh, that will take the place of the sub eddy complex and have some different properties. But uh, I'll talk about that at my next talk because it gives rise to something really interesting that we're still working on now. So I'm going to skip that and then uh, go straight to uh, the methods. So, uh, so this is actually, that was section one, this is section three. Uh, and now it looks like I'm more familiar. But so, what do you mean? Okay, so, G is the one that we consider. which is well known to people, that's the lower sum. Okay. Uh, what can we say? Well, the first thing is that the first Betty number, this one, H1, dimension, is equal to the number of hyperplanes. So that's what I call V1. So at least you can tell how many vertices there are at the bottom from H1. And um, what this is equal to is, uh, is This is the number of edges in gamma minus the size of each. So you get some minimal amount of information just from the betting numbers, the first two betting numbers. Uh, this is essentially saying for the experts, the group G determines the characters on the point right 
Oh, I guess you get one. Sure, just one more. Elevate, so that's, I didn't introduce that notation. That's the intersection lattice. So that's some information about A, which you get from the group, just from the many numbers. Uh, but then, uh, more interestingly, Just that they're isomorphic as the DNA groups, but the ring is isomorphic. If you just truncate, if you just look at the degree one and degree two parts, the, the rings are isomorphic. So this R1 of GK. Okay? So from 
the resonance variety. Well, anyway, this gives you a hint that you might be able to deduce some about the structure of gamma from the resonance variety. Uh, I should say for each V, and these are called local problems. Uh, there are other components too. It would be, life would be a lot simpler if there weren't, but that's interesting. Uh, this is uh, well. So in the old paper line, I made an observation. So this, in this context, uh, it says G determines the characteristic polynomial of the lattice. So that if you study matrices and lattices, you might wonder about the top polynomial which is a generalization of characteristic power. Is that what I'm about to say something about? Say it's been all uh, linear, but non linear. Uh, I have to mention T. Mike, what's the degree of a point? Number of lines by C3? Degree of yeah. Oh yeah, number of uh, number of edges coming out of the vertex. But then it should be degree should be more than uh, degree minus two. If you have degree ah, plus yeah. two, you go like that. Triple point. No, I'm taking back. No. Triple point is in the triple point. Projectively. It's lower you projectively. projectively, not projectively. Then you know, triple point gives you two dimension. Triple point. Yeah. You're right. E1 minus E2 and E2 minus E3. Double point. Double point doesn't give you anything. Right. It says, it says that three has to Okay. Be it's all. It's wrong. I know you're right. I think I've been thinking about this for a long time. And I have two floating through my mind, so pretty much better than two. Uh, uh, what is this? If all the if all non linear non multiple points of uh, one have dimension two. Thanks 
I don't know if their argument works for pseudo arrangements, but it may. I think they thought. But anyway, um, so this is, in my current thinking, a kind of a rigidity result. Yes? Let's start with the Betty numbers. They determine the sums of these degrees, essentially. The Betty numbers determine the number of vertices in V1, and they determine the sums of the degrees in V2. And then um, using R1, and using the complexity of real arrangements, R1 actually determines the degrees themselves in V2. Okay, so this is a bold, bold result. information about that one, just the multi-set of dimensions of components to determine the top polynomial? Yeah. Perfect. I'm so, yeah. So, so, so I'll, I'll repeat what Alex said. Um, or explain a little bit. So this says, so you get local components of a certain dimension depending on the degree, and then you get some other components. And uh, so if all you gave me about R1 was just the list of dimensions of components. And somehow you knew a priori that uh, there were no non-local components that had dimension bigger than two. Then you could deduce uh, this multi-step. Okay? But there's still a the question about how those components are situated. And that's what the rest of the talk is kind of about. This was, this was kind of uh, get to an introductory statement. Let's see how far I can get that. So, um, yeah. let's get that. Um, let me just, let me go ahead and do, talk about these examples. So this is actually a picture of the dual of the arrangement. So I'm thinking of uh, an arrangement of lines in the projective plane that has a dual that consists of points corresponding to the lines and lines corresponding to the points. And that's what this is a picture of. So this arrangement has nine lines. Sorry. <laughs> the configuration has nine points. They correspond to nine lines in the projective Okay. And if you count the number of lines in this picture, you'll find that there's also nine. And that means in the dual picture, there's sorry, there's lines that I haven't drawn here. There are nine lines that have at least three points on them. And uh, each point lies on three of those lines, and each of those lines has three points on it. That's why it's called a nine-three configuration. Okay? picture makes sense? It's a reflection of the Pappas theorem because uh, 
this, maybe I'll just get this line out of it. It's implied that ninth line, that ninth collinearity is implied by the other eight. That's Pappus' theory. Okay? Um, so in Hilbert's paper, in Hilbert's book, 1933 book, he classifies nine three configurations. There's two of them besides this one, called nine three two and nine three three. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I was gonna project these pictures, but I'm gonna attempt to draw them. these examples is that this multi-set of degrees is the same in all three. Uh, so then the question is, uh, suppose you take these corresponding arrangements and you look at the complements and you look at the groups, can you somehow distinguish the three configurations by looking at the groups? Is the, the middle one supposed to be asymmetric? Uh, It's beautifully symmetric in this picture. And I'm just not sure that I drew it correctly. I think I did. No, I see. There's one point line, four lines. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. I said chalk is very forgiving. supposed to be straight lines. It's kind of rigid. You have to, like, there's only, it's actually projectively unique. There's only one way up to when you change your coordinates to draw this. Anyway, now let me get to the, to the main point. Um, so the question is how to distinguish. So using first resonance by Okay? Uh, the idea is like this. Let's see the set of components. Thank you. 
for every subset of for every set of components, you the span of their union. Some of the dimensions of the span. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm hedging a little bit because I haven't said that these components are all linear. But if I were to say k had characteristic zero, then all of these components would be linear, and I would have to do the spans. Uh, is where I'm stuck at the moment. Anyway, if these are all linear subspaces, you take the sum of the dimensions of the subspaces, and that's, that's bigger than or equal to the dimension of the span. Yeah. But uh, there's also a restriction, and that is uh, uh, I skipped section four when I defined this thing. So just, uh, if I can do it uh, easily. Yeah. So I think for every such thing, we take the support of L, which is the set of, yeah, this is So I'm just going to describe this in words. This H1, where these things live, has a natural basis corresponding to the hyperplanes in A. So it comes, with, it comes equipped with a natural set of coordinates. And then for each subspace, uh, or for each element L, take a generic point on it and look at which coordinates are non-zero. That's what I mean by support. And uh, there's some property of R1 that says that it's that it's uh, contained in a hyperplane. So its maximum dimension is the dimension of that hyperplane, which is uh, this. So there's some restriction on, on these rings. All right. So uh, so I'll just say well, let me say something about this structure, this, this rank function. So this is called a polymatrix. This set C together with this function R. If if C consists of one-dimensional linear subspaces, then this would essentially be the definition of matroid. Some, some properties that R should have, and that would be the definition of matroid. So uh, this is more general, and there's less structure. But there's still a notion of closed set. So, theory if, uh, if I have a collection of components and then I have another component that other guy is in the closure of this set when it's contained in the span okay take all possible subsets take their spans and look at the other components in those spans those are the closed sets and then uh, what is this Second guy, two. There are. Oh. 
before I write this down, I'll say what makes this computation possible is that neither 932 nor 933 have any non-local components. All the components arise in this kind of easy way from uh, the vertices of the graph. And so then that makes it very complicated. It's just linear algebra, you write down what these subspaces are, you ask your computer to compute these numbers, to compute this function, and what you find is this. There are 192 subsets of S that don't have kind of the expected dimension. structure in the degree one resonance graph. So the reason I wanted to do this, this isn't uh, in, in my paper with the manual, but uh, when I was here in 2010, this is, I did this, that's when I did this computation. I never put it in any paper, in, but it's kind of interesting, don't you agree? So then, uh, let, me, uh, let me show you how this, so this is kind of, except for doing this computation, this was kind of the, uh, the state of affairs for the last 15 years when it's supported in this paper. So then, actually, I moved this picture up. Let's talk about 931. But I haven't drawn the heavy line in the middle. That's meant to indicate that those three points are deemed to be not collinear in this abstract configuration. So this still defines a matroid. It's a kind of a legitimate graph. It's orientable. You know what that means? There is actually an arrangement of pseudo lines or pseudo planes in C3, like I defined at the beginning of the talk, that has this incident structure. Okay? But it's not possible to realize with linear uh, with linear hyperplanes over any <coughs> field because Pappus's theorem holds over any field. And so if you force the eight collinearities that I've indicated in the picture, the ninth is a consequence, and so if I say that the ninth doesn't hold, that means it's not realizing. Okay? So, there's a pseudo arrangement corresponding to it. There's a Salvetti complex associated with that pseudo arrangement. There's a space with a fundamental group. You can ask, is that fundamental group isomorphic to the fundamental group of any realizable? And the answer is no. And the method is to study this 
degree one resonance for that. Three minutes. Can I start by hitting three? What <laughs> um, I'm going to try to give you an idea of what the ingredients are. Okay. So, um, and I'll maybe do this without writing anything on the board. So the first issue is uh, local versus non-local components. Just pretend for a minute that we knew that the that uh, the resonance variety for the group associated with this guy had no non-local components. Then we know something at least about this graph or about the underlying lattice. We would know that it has, since, since every one of these eight three-point lines gives you a two-dimensional component in the resonance variety, sorry, let me back up. Ah, so I'm, here I have an actual configuration that has an Arlick Solomon algebra. I can actually compute the resonance for this. And I discover that it has no non local components. It's eight local components of dimension two. So now suppose I have a, I have a realizable arrangement with an isomorphic group. Then the resonance variety for that group will have eight two dimensional components. Now suppose I can, I know that it has no non-local components. Then I know the arrangement has, you know, in this graph that there's eight vertices of degree three at level two, and nothing else. And just vertices of degree two, that's kind of determined by the number of points. Okay, so there's an issue of non-local components. The other issue is I I have these two-dimensional subspaces ordered on three-point sets, but I won't be able to tell if two of them have a point in common. This is actually difficult. Like this guy gives me a two-dimensional component, and uh, this guy gives me another two-dimensional component. These two lines intersect in this point. But in the resonance variety, those two components intersect only at the origin. And the same is true if the lines were disjoint. So that is the big issue, is kind of determining the points in the picture, knowing the lines. So uh, what we did, I'll just give you a 60-second capsule summary. So from 1983, there's a catalog of all Matroids on eight or fewer points, written by, well, in 1973 there was a paper by Blackburn, Crapo, and Higgs. And then in 1983 there was an update on it by Dragan Aketa, an Ukrainian mathematician who died recently. I want to give him his due. He corrected a couple of errors in the Blackburn, Crapo, and Higgs paper and uh, just gave a very nice catalog. I looked through this catalog with a few preliminary computations to see what was possible, checked every one of the kind of 69 different matroids on eight or fewer points to see if there was any possibility of non-local components in an arrangement that would have this group and found that there were none. And then, uh, for small matroids, small arrangements, say, um, six points or seven points, there's only a few, well, there's a couple that are actually characterized by their resonance values in terms of this closure. Like if there's only three three-point lines, <coughs> then you can actually look at the resonance variety and tell what nature you If there's only four three-point lines, then you can look at the resonance variety and tell what nature you and in the one that has four, you can actually identify two submatroids and pick out a special point. And uh, so by staring at this picture quite a bit, you can, you can extract submatroids, these kind of special submatroids that are determined by the resonance varieties in such a way that you can actually reconstruct the points and the incidences. And so the upshot is, if I had another, if I had an arrangement 
whose group was isomorphic to the group of this non campus arrangement. And its intersection, its combinatorics would have to be identical to this non campus arrangement. And then it would be non realizable. So that's the proof of the theory. And if you're interested, you can look at the paper on the archive and read all the details. So. 